Fantastic. Tina Phillips is joining us from uh, Cornell University, where she's been working on evaluation programs for some time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's been one of my great aspirations to visit Australia, so to visit Australia in the context of citizen science has been doubly rewarding, I have to say. Um, so I'm going to talk today about my um, PhD dissertation research. This is work that has been funded by the National Science Foundation and its collaborative research with the uh, University of California, Davis. Um, I am actually in the process of writing this paper up, so you guys are the first to hear about this particular part, of this particular chapter of my dissertation. So the study actually begins about 20 years ago. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time, no. Um, I have been doing this for a long time. But uh, about 20 years ago when I started the Lab of Ornithology, I was the project leader for a program called Nestwatch, which still exists today. Um, and I was really in charge of coordinating the participants and the data. Um, I spent a lot of time, though, talking to the participants, citizen scientists, and I became very, very interested in what their experience was. People like Pauline Tom, who would write me almost weekly, giving me suggestions for how to improve the data entry. That was fun. Um, Jeff Kozma, who uh, would monitor over 150 nest boxes on a weekly basis and send a oh, dozen or so beautiful images that basically became the library of our uh, photo base. Um, and Shelley Sutley, who took over a trail from a, a friend of hers who was dying of cancer. She, had, uh, she still does have multiple sclerosis herself. And she took the trail over and not only took it over, but um, doubled it in size, engaged the community, had uh, kids participating, and to this day says it has been her lifesaver. So these kinds of experiences as a project leader, you know, you hear them and you start to wonder, you know, what is my project having? What kind of impact is it having on these, on these individuals? And I became really, really interested in that. And in 2009, um, in 2009 is when the, the, my uh, interest really geared up in terms of my dissertation. And I wondered this question, what is engagement? What does it mean? We throw this word around quite a bit, right? But we don't really define it. It's actually been defined in some disciplines, but not really well. Maybe the educational uh, theory is where it's been defined the most. But with respect to citizen science, we usually think about it as Things we can count, right? Number of participants, amount of data, number of web visits, number of downloads, recruitment, volunteer hours. But what does this tell us about the experience? Not much, right? We don't really know what it is that they experience. And that's really what I wanted to get at in one of my chapters. And so in 2009, um, some of you have, are probably familiar with this report. Uh, myself and six others, Rick Bonney with the, with, was spearheading this. We wanted to take a closer look at what uh, engagement looked like across uh, tons of different projects. We looked at 10, actually. Um, and uh, we wanted to understand what kinds of learning was possible from the projects. Um, one of the things that came out of that study was this typology, which has been shown in a couple of different talks over the past few days. And the typology basically goes that there are contributory, top-down science projects that are um, developed by scientists, and the participants engage in collecting data and maybe analyzing some samples. Collaborative projects do a little bit more, and the co-created projects do even more. Um, and this, this has been a good typology for us to, to think about and when we think about different forms of engagement. Um, but for me, the 10 projects that we looked at were very descriptive in nature, so we didn't really have the data to say for sure that this is what it looks like, right? So this became my uh, second research question. First was, what is engagement? And second was, well, is this how scientific practices in citizen science really bear out? So I'll just go through quickly some of the methods because I don't want to spend too much time on that and get to the results. But um, I looked at a couple of different perspectives, self-determination theory for motivation, um, a lot of uh, literature from the engagement theory work, looking at situated learning theory and communities of practice, 
and then also um, some of the frameworks that are available in the informal science learning uh, which is um, a lot of it is National Research Council and NSF funded in the, in the US. So I did a mixed methods comparative study design. Um, case study designs are really nice because you can use different forms of data, you can triangulate your data, you can use different forms of analysis, and you can guide it by theoretical perspe perspectives. I had six projects in the study. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My two contributory projects were Nestwatch and Monarch Larvae. Nestwatch is the project I told you about, one that I used to be project leader of for 10 years. Um, Monarch Larvae is a, a butterfly larvae monitoring project. Um, the two collaborative projects were Cocoros, which you may have heard of. It's a weather monitoring project. Um, and then the Hudson River Eel Project. It's a very small localized project that happens in upstate New York, where they actually monitor American eels. Um, and then the co-created projects were um, ALARM, which is a water quality monitoring project, and then GCM, Global Community Monitor, which is an air quality monitoring project. Um, so this is one, one of my chapters. I had, this is the qualitative work. I also have quantitative work, which I'm not going to talk about today. But so basically, following the lit review, we created an, I created an interview protocol. Um, Myself, along with three other people, conducted 72 phone interviews, which lasted between 60 minutes to two hours in some cases. And um, we coded all of the um, interviews using NVivo software. Um, and this was just, this is a very abbreviated uh, example of the questions we asked, but we were trying to get at motivations and barriers and what kinds of behaviors we asked them for explicit detail and what they did as a part of the, as part of their participation. Um, we asked their feelings, what was the most memorable day that they had? Um, what things did, did they do to learn to participate? We didn't ask them what did they learn because we all know participants learn a whole lot about content and I didn't want to get into that. I really was more interested in what they used, what their sources of learning were. And then, um, you know, getting into this whole idea of role expansion, communities of practice. So, um, the sample that I have here, we were hoping that all of the projects looked like Nestwatch. Sorry, the, the, the sample sizes are covered up there, but they all have 12 except for Alarm, which has 10 participants, and GCM, which has 14. But um, we wanted to hear from what project leaders claimed they thought were their low participants, their medium, and their high participants. So a low participant might be somebody who signed up and maybe submitted data just once. Um, a medium participant did it fairly regularly, and then the high participants were the people that did it constantly, continuously, according to the protocol. So only Nestwatch actually gave us that really nice, even distribution. Um, and that, you know, that tells us something about who we attract when we ask for the, their uh, input in a study like this. Um, and so this is what we uh, coded when we looked at the dimensions of engagement. Uh, so you can see that the things in bold here are the things I'm just going to talk about real briefly. Sources refers to the number of individuals that mentioned it. And you can see in almost every case, every person mentioned it because we asked these questions specifically. Um, in the case of barriers, there were seven people will be asked what barriers to participation do you have. They said none, so they didn't get coded. But um, so the sources is the number of people. References is the number of times something was mentioned. So you can see project activities and practices was mentioned almost 5,000 times across the 72 people. So that had a lot of weight, and, and so did things like the motivations and the affective. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about each of these things. So this is a, a, a heavy graphic. Um, basically what I did is I looked at, I, I coded the motivations, and then I lined them up on this graphic on the y-axis with extrinsic motivations up top and more intrinsic motivations down below. Intrinsic motivations being things like interest, enjoyment, contribution, learning. Extrinsic motivations being things like concern, distrust, credibility, fear, worry. Um, and what you notice right away is that environmental concern is sort of across the board uh, a huge motivator for a lot of people. But it's particularly so for the co-created projects, GCM and ALARM. And on the other end of the spectrum, you see that for the, the contributory and the collaborative projects, they're much more uh, likely to be in the interest, enjoyment, cont contribution, the intrinsic categories of engagement. 
this was one of the clearest sort of uh, results that I got from this work, and it was actually collaborated w with uh, my quantitative work showed basically the same exact thing. Okay, so when we coded individual um, aspects of engagement, when we looked at feelings, the numbers here are the sources, so the number of individuals that actually said something relative to concern, commitment, surprise, interest, excitement, uncertainty, efficacy, and recognition. These are all the things that people said when they were, when they were asked about memorable events or how they felt about the project. And I had really cool quotes to show all of you, but I couldn't do it in 15 minutes. So you're just going to have to trust me that the quotes are really fabulous and really powerful and compelling. Um, Social connections, this one was really surprising because all but five people remarked repeatedly about the p importance and the power of the relationships, mostly with the organization or the individual project leader, but oftentimes with participants themselves. It was just really surprising, and I'll show you a different data set that, that shows it even more clearly. Also, the use of mutual resources, so the kinds of things that we provide for people um, that were being shared was really important the shared knowledge that people gave to each other, not just project leader to participant, but in the other direction as well and with between participants, and then role expansion. So 22 people talked about um, starting out as a, a, a part, an ordinary participant and becoming a trainer. We had another individual who changed job careers because they wanted to not be an environmental scientist anymore. They wanted to be a science communicator because their community was being overtaken by fracking and they didn't need more scientists. They needed people who could communicate the science better to the community. So really powerful stuff. Um, with respect to sources of learning, there was uh, not surprising. Most of how they learned was through the experience, experiential learning. Um, again, the project materials and training were super valuable. Many people came in with pre-existing knowledge, mostly in the contributory and collaborative projects. Uh, learning from others was really important, and also they sought out external sources of learning. And then I'm going to get into this a little bit more with the behavioral practices, because this leads into my number two research question. Everyone gathered and submitted, gathered data, most submitted data. Here's a, the other very surprising thing. Every single person talked about sharing information. Not necessarily communicating findings, but just being an ambassador for the project and talking to other people about it, which is really quite cool. Um, and data exploration, um, I bold the data use because I was really blown away by the way that people described using the data. So almost half of them described using the data. Um, and totally in totally different ways. So if you're a nest watcher, you're using the data to manage your trail, but if you're in global community monitor, you're using the data to get a voice at the table with a federal agency. So really different, but still very powerful and compelling ways. And so this is the framework that I've sort of developed when I um, am publishing this work on this engagement framework. And it's not uh, exhaustive, there's probably a whole lot more to add, but um, I think the thing to take away here, especially if you're a project leader, is that your project may be um, really good at getting the behavioral practices uh, in, in check, and, um, or maybe it's the social connections, but you should be aware that participants are engaged in all aspects. They have feelings, they have concerns, they have worry and uncertainty. They're making all of these um, connections. They have all these sources of learning. And so as project leaders, it's important for us to build our projects to uh, impact all of these things, or at least to uh, allow for all of these things to be available to the participants. OK, and so then getting to the second question about the scientific practices. Again, this is the number of sources and the number of times things are mentioned. So not surprising, data collection is mentioned the most in terms of the, the scientific practice. Um, and then you see the sharing information. Every single person shared information about the project. That was so totally surprising to me. Um, and from this, this is aggregated across all the projects. Uh, from this, then I tried to look at amongst the individual projects. And I know this is, this is a tough one, but um, 
The top half of this are the social activities, the bottom half are the science activities. So if we just look at the top half, um, broken up by the projects, again, every single one sharing information, um, but it, it gets a little different than when you look at projects looking at communicating findings. So GCM, not surprising, right? This is what they wanted to collect the data for. They wanted that data to be used and communicated. Um, recruiting participants, on the other hand, happen more often with Nestwatch, a contributory project. Um, attending meetings was really uh, uh, remarked upon quite often by the co-created projects, but not so much the other projects. Um, down here, one thing I noticed right away is that um, maybe some of the higher order kinds of science process skills, like forming hypotheses, asking questions, analyze, interpreting data, not not done as extensively as we may have thought, right? Pe what people are doing mostly is collecting data, submitting data, exploring data, and to some extent using data. And so according to the Bonnie model, this is what it looks like, right? But when I actually coded my projects and my interviews, if I looked at um, an activity, if it was by 50% of the, um, the grouping within a contributor collaborative co-created, this is more what it looked like. So, <laughs> um, the typology that we created in 2009 um, doesn't bear out in what the qualitative work that I've created here. It actually um, also doesn't look like this in the quantitative work. So, summary of findings. Uh, I didn't talk about barriers to participation, but um, besides time, most of the barriers for the individual projects were very unique to that project. Um, motivations play a really significant and important role, and, and it's something that we need to pay attention to. The majority of participants engage in three main things, data collection, data submission, and sharing information, and that's across all projects. Um, across all projects, this higher order science process skills are not as evident as, as what we like to think, at least not from these data. Um, but I do think even given the, um, you know, the, the emphasis on sharing, submitting data, um, there's a whole other spectrum of their experience that, that are being largely ignored, and it's the affective, it's the motivational, it's the social, and it's the behavioral dimension. So we need to pay attention to all these dimensions. Um, and in, in all, what I heard over and over and over again was that their engagement, the reason they stay is because it's personally meaningful and it's relevant. And if we can make sure that all of our projects are personally meaningful and relevant, I think it goes, goes a long way to not only recruiting but retaining our participants. And so I'll just say that, um, so we're not, the usefulness of that typology with respect to engagement I think is quite limited and we might have to start maybe moving away from it when we're thinking about what participants do. Um, we can use this to leverage strengths of different projects. Um, the framework I think can be used to enhance participant experiences in our projects. And I actually have created a metric that we used in the quantitative survey um, that eventually will get published, but if you want to talk to me more about it, uh, it's a way for us to measure these social and scientific practices in a quantifiable way. So thank you very much. Sorry, I don't know if I went over. <laughs>